Uh, we're going to introduce a song that uh, you may have heard on the radio. It's called uh, The Reason I Sing. It's a really simple song, and the reason why we're doing this today is because um, it, it goes right in line with what we're talking about today in our message. And it's, it's really, um, you know, do we sing because of duty or do we sing because of desire? Like, are, are we forcing you to stand and sing this morning out of duty or are you desiring to sing to the Lord. And that really goes along with what our, our theme in Galatians is all about. So as you sing this song, I want you to just uh, test your heart, check your heart, and just see why is the reason that we sing uh, to God the Father. It goes like this. Heaven is waiting for me. 
pray together. Heavenly Father, we realize that we're here not because of a duty, not because we have to. Lord, we're here because we want to. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Meet us right where we are. Even with the distractions of this world, Lord, you still want to meet with us. You cry out to us, Lord. You cry out to us, Lord. You long to have a relationship with us, Lord. It's what we're talking about today. You long to have that relationship and to have a reason to sing to you, Father, and to worship you. We give our hearts to you, Lord Jesus. We give our souls to you. We give our voice to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated at this time. Amen. Now we come to the time in our service when we can bring first of all God has given each of us today. There are several ways you can give. First, you can place your tithes in the offering box on the back table. You can send your tithe to P.O. Box 106 in Emerson. You can text to give by texting the word GIVE to 833-429-6868. Give through our mobile app. Give through website at lakepointonline.com. And then, of course, Venmo. And you can find everything I just said on Lake Point Online. The scripture for today is taken from Psalm 141, verses 1 through 7. O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to any evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds, in company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their delicacies. Let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. When their judges are thrown over the cliff, then they shall hear my words, for they are pleasant. As one who plows and breaks up the earth, so shall our bones be scattered at the mouth of Sheol. Let us pray. Father God, we do give you thanks and praise for everything that you have given us. And Father, today we thank you for the shelter. We thank you for the food, the transportation, the jobs, retirement, whatever that may be, Father God. But most importantly, we thank you for the spiritual blessing of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for his sins. Thank you, Jesus, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, Pastor Terry. Uh, have you ever uh, tried to do things your very best and they just, they just fall short? <laughs> Um, obviously, we had some technical issues in our service today. We're going to figure that out. We try our best, and everything ran so smooth and, and stuff. But I tell you what, uh, what that reminded me is this, is that we, as I said earlier, our imperfections, we come just as we are, right? And God can move through that. And that is the prayer. As I was singing that last song, I was singing and playing and praying at the same time. Don't ask me how I, could, I did that, but I think the Holy Spirit moved through me on that. But it, just, it was in my prayer that we would just not let distractions uh, get in the way of what God wants to say to you today. You are here for a reason. God puts you here. And, and I love that you desire to be here. Now, there may be some students here today, or maybe some uh, other spouses here today. Maybe you're a drug to church here today. But even if that's the case, uh, I mean, we have six kids, and so uh, there have been many times we've had to dra drag our kids literally uh, to church. But uh, even if that is your case and your situation, it is my prayer that God will speak to you today. Um, so we are... Um, we are in Galatians in our series here, and last week we took a uh, we took a week off of Galatians because we celebrated our ten year anniversary, and so grateful that uh, all that God has done, and uh, so many of y'all were part of that celebration. And so we are moving forward in our next decade. Uh, our real birthday, birthday, even though we celebrated last Sunday, our official birthday was was uh, this past Friday, and so yesterday was the first day of the new decade. And 
And so we're moving on by the grace of God and as we follow his Holy Spirit and we will be a church uh, that follows the Lord, that li- listens to the Holy Spirit and asks the Holy Spirit to move in our services and in our hearts. And there's some things that God wants to do differently in year, in the, in the second uh, decade of our church. And I believe that he's already been speaking to us about that. And so as we, as we go on for the next few weeks, you'll hear more and more and more about that. But we are gonna be in uh, Galatians chapter four uh, most of the day uh, of the sermon now, we actually will start in, at the end, towards the end of Galatians 3 to kind of set up for. But let me set this, uh, this up a little bit in case you've forgotten or maybe you're new here today. Um, the Galatians is a book, but it's actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a bunch of churches he planted in the region called Galatia, which is present day Turkey. And so Paul uh, wrote this, and the reason why is he heard that there were, some, there were some Jewish Christians who were like, all right, you, even though you're Christians, you Gentiles, all you Gentiles, even though you're, you're now call yourself believers, you've got to follow all of these uh, rules and regulations of the law, including circumcision, in order for you to be a Christian. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. Jesus did not die for that. <laughs> There's a new covenant, and, and a, a a New Testament, and so um, he he wrote this letter for those churches, and that that wasn't just for them; it's for us today because God's word is alive and active today. And so, uh, the reason why it speaks to us today is that um, many Christians may have um, may have found the freedom and grace in Jesus Christ, only to go back into. Not what Jesus has done for us, but what we can do for ourselves. Meaning, we go back to trying to live that good life by ourselves on our own strength without picking up God's word, without praying, without having a relationship. And we try to do that on our own. Do you know that there's millions of people in this world that try to, try to sort of earn their way into heaven by doing good things? Many people, a lot of different religions. But whether they are religious people or not, or even if they don't believe in heaven, they just try to do good by their own actions. And they fall short, like we all do. We fall short of the glory of God. And that's really what the Old Testament was about. God said, all right, here's the law. Here it is. In order for you to get to heaven, you've got to follow all of these things. And uh, the people couldn't do that. You know why? Why? None of us can. We are born sinners. So that's why God introduced the new covenant, saying, you know what? You can't do it. And I know you couldn't, but I'm, we're going to come down, Jesus Christ, who will live a sinless life, and, and he is going to take the, uh, the shame and the punishment for your sin for us. Uh, week one, we, looked about, we talked about living um, in the right sort of tree. And we have the Garden of Eden, we have the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and we have the tree of life. Um, And, um, you know, one brings life, and the other brings burden. Other brings burden. We we try to follow our own rules and regulations, or we follow the freedom of the Spirit. Week two, we talked about living the crucified life. If you surrender your heart to Jesus and follow him, then your passions and desires have to be crucified with him. Now, they were crucified but on the cross, but we have to make that choice every day to crucify our passions and desires. And uh, week three, we talked about living in grace. What does grace stand for? Grace, we use the acrostic, G-R-A-C-E. Grace uh, stands for a gift, it is a free gift, something we can't earn. But it's also something R, we receive. It's a gift that we receive. We have to receive it. God doesn't, God doesn't, doesn't put, it, put it on us, okay? We have to receive it. It's like if you, Amazon guy drops a bo- box off and it stays on your front porch and you never open it and, you, and, and, and it's there. Uh, just because he dropped it off it doesn't, doesn't mean that you've received it. You've got to get the box. You've got to open it. God has given you a free gift of salvation. You have to open your heart to receive that. So it's a gift, it's received, it's available. (laughs) It is available to everyone. It doesn't matter what your life is. It doesn't matter how messed up your life has been, what you've done in the past, or what you're trying to do to be a good person. It's available to everyone. Everyone. 
available. And then uh, it only comes through Christ. Grace only comes through Jesus Christ as we believe upon him. So it is a gift that we, um, that we receive because it's available to everyone only through Christ and it lasts eternity. E. It lasts for eternity. In other words, that one-time decision of grace, of you accepting Jesus Christ and accepting that gift will last forever. Now, there are certain gifts. You, you ever receive a gift that, that just didn't last forever? Like maybe an electronic component just didn't last, okay? Or, or uh, let's say, if you, kids, you got a toy and uh, it just didn't last. And, but, but this gift right here of salvation will last and eternity, and it's only something you need to receive once. Now, you need to make that choice to crucify the flesh every day and follow after him, but that is what grace is. And so today's focus is, uh, will be in chapter four, and it's all about living in relationship with God. God never intended to be your religion. Let me say that again. God never intended for you to be, um, for him to be your religion. This idea of a relationship is what he wanted. It's all about a relationship, not a religion. And we see this, if you look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 27, as we prep for uh, chapter 4, Galatians chapter 3, my Bible was marked for when I spoke at FCA this week. All right, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 27. 27. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So, this sets up chapter 4. So, this is, we are all children of God. Now, let me make something very clear. Many people think, oh, we're all children of God, whether you, be, whether you have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior or not. That's not really true, okay? Now, your creations of God, God loves you. You're created by him, absolutely. But you're not a child of God until you have called him your father, your daddy, until you've received him as your Lord and Savior, as you, until you receive Jesus Christ and you surrender to him and you follow after him, then you are adopted into the family of God, which God is your Father. So if you have accepted Christ as Savior, then you are a child of God, the maker of creation, the maker of all things, calls you his child calls you his child. You are a child of God. So look at uh, chapter four, verse four through seven. And it says this. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Now say, you know, God made you a son. I mean, it's the same thing. God made you a son, a daughter, you know, whatever, you know, you know, whatever obviously you are on that. So he made you a son and a daughter to his kingdom. And so this idea of God being a father was, was foreign to the people back then, okay? Because God was someone who was, who was feared, the, the God who, could, who, who can part the Red Sea, which he still can, okay? The God who could send all kinds of locusts and plagues on, on the Egyptians, which he still can, the God who, who has done all of these mighty, powerful things where people fear him, that is people's perception of who God is, whether they were Jews or Gentiles. Believe me, the Gentiles heard about all the stories of God. He spent the entire Old Testament telling the world through one family, starting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and through that one family to let the world know, I am God and who, this is what I can do. And then, 
In the New Testament, God's like, now, this all-powerful God, who I am, I'm all-powerful, but guess what? I love you so much that I'm going to prove it. I'm coming down. I'm coming down to rescue you. And so many people had this, did, didn't, didn't have this view of God as father, but as a, as a feared sort of almighty sort of Wizard of Oz kind of person behind a curtain, you can't access him. And so people, this was new to people, but God is our father. So what, what Paul does there in those verses we just read, he sort of starts this process of, of um, comparing a slave and a son, or son, daughter, a ch- basically a child of God. The difference between a slave and a son or daughter. Now, as we walk through this, there's, there's about three examples I'm going to share with you, or three differences I'm going to share with you. But, but, the, but the difference is all about relationships. Everybody say relationships. That's what we're talking about today. There is a relationship like a slave, and there is a relationship like a son. Which one are you? Which one are you? Or do you picture God as someone, as, as, as you are a slave to him, or a son or daughter to him? So here's some examples. Example number one, or difference number one. The slave has a master. The slave has a master. The master is always mad at you or demanding something of you. Someone, uh, some of you may have that approach to God to where you feel like you have to, you have to please him to where he's, he's, he's mad at you, okay? But a son has a father. A son or daughter has a father, A son jumps in the lap of a father. (laughs) A slave doesn't do that. A slave doesn't doesn't run in and and just, you know, hugs a father or or hugs his master and hops in the the lap of of his father. There isn't that kind of relationship. But a son or daughter does. Look at Romans uh, 8, 15 through 16. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. There it is. Perfect. Paul saying this again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So when, when you receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, you're not a slave to God. You're a child of God. You don't have a master. You have a father. You have a father. You could tell a slave, you could tell a, uh, you're a slave if you have an, an unhealthy fear of God. If you have an unhealthy fear of God, you could tell that you're a slave to that. Abba, father, was a Jewish way of, of, of saying Daddy. Abba means daddy. Daddy, God. You can always tell what kind of relationship you have with someone by how they call you. (laughs) I mean, people here, they they call me Pastor Frank, and uh, and, and that's awesome, and and, and I answer to lots of different things, but one of the things I don't really answer to, and and, and sometimes, and I've never really had people uh, call me this at Lake Point Church, but someone would call me, and they would say, Reverend Bennett. <laughs> and they'd be like, you don't know me, bro. You don't know me. And, and I understand. They, they, they just don't. They, they, they just feel like they need to call me Reverend Bennett. And so you can tell the relationships of someone by how they call you. This past week, I was able to, to uh, do a chapel. I did two chapel services, one here at Red Top uh, for the FCA, and I did one at uh, Grace Academy, and uh, one, one of the uh, little children here of the DeMint family, uh, she came and, and she introduced me and, uh, in, in the chapel service. And it was so sweet because uh, she, she called him Pastor Frank, okay? She did not introduce me as Reverend Bennett, and I know she wouldn't do that. Why? Because she knows me, and I know her. You could tell a lot by 
how you call someone, how do you call God, oh, thou dearest father? I mean, do, 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 you, have to, do you have to do that? Have you ever sat down in prayer and just called him daddy? Have you just sat down in prayer and just called him daddy? That's what Abba means, daddy. And, and you think, well, that's, your, that's, you know, that's not you know, reverent enough. He deserves respect. Yes, he deserves respect. Absolutely. And you can call him father. Absolutely. But there are times I just need to sit down at his feet and call him daddy. Call him daddy. And you know what? He's okay with that. He's okay with that. Because the reverence is all about your heart, your posture of your spirit. Because he longs for you to sit at his feet. We'll see that a little bit later. So, one difference is a slave, um, a slave has a master and a son has a father. Um, here's another difference. A slave is an employee. A slave is an employee. Have you ever been to a, a restaurant and the server has no ownership of the business? <laughs> right? They don't really care about your experience. If you see yourself... An employee of God or or working for God rather than being a part of the family business, then you are a slave. You are a slave if you consider yourself working for God. We are not a slave to God as he is our, our employer. We are not an employee, but rather, here's the difference, a son or daughter is an heir. A son or daughter is an heir. A slave is an employee. A son is an heir. This is your business. I don't work for God. I work with God. I don't work for God. I work with God. And let me tell you, as a pastor, sometimes it's easy to get that mixed up. (laughs) Right? And not just as a pastor, but as as people, as we serve him, we think, well, I work for God. No, you don't work for God. You work with God. You work with God. This past week, Landon and I got a chance to go eat at a, at a restaurant there at the end of your Harley Road. It's called Kebabs. And uh, I've eaten there once before. And uh, it's great Mediterranean food. And, and we walked in, and it was, it was well after lunch, and so there really wasn't anybody else in there. It's great food. I high, highly recommend it. I just wanted some good gyro and rice and a, just a pita. And so I went in there, and, uh, and, the, and there was a, a, a young gentleman, uh, looks like in his um, mid-20s, mid to late 20s, and he had an LSU shirt on. We're like, hey, <laughs> you don't see that often. You know, especially near your Harley and, and here in Georgia. Hey, LSU. And I was like, hey, go Tigers. He's like, go Tigers. And so we, we were talking about that. And, and um, he was, he was uh, talking about LSU and, and come to find out his, um, his dad was sitting there. And his dad actually graduated from LSU. And I said, hey, have you been to LSU game uh, to, the, to the son and who was that behind the cash register? And he's like, no, I haven't. And it's like, man, you need to go. It's a great experience. So we were talking about that in football. But, but this gentleman, he took incredible care of us, this, this young man. I mean, just went above and beyond. And even while serving, and he, 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 didn't, ask for, he didn't ask for a tip. Okay. He, he, he just was serving us and made sure we had everything we, we needed, asking lots of questions and just really walking us into this, um, this restaurant. You know why? He's an heir. He ran the restaurant like it's his. You know why? Because his father was working there. He didn't work for his father. He literally worked with his father. That is how God wants you to treat him, okay? You are not a slave, or you are not an, an, an employee. You are a son or daughter. You are an heir. You know, we kind of go over a little bit of this with, um, with the new member class. When we do new member classes, by the way, in your bulletin, there's a couple of new member classes we have coming up. Love for you to sign up for that. I think this Wednesday and maybe uh, next Sunday after church. Just let us know. But in our new member class, we go over the fact that, hey, this is your church. 
This is your church. This isn't Frank's church, okay? This is your church, okay? Those chairs are your chairs. That, those drums are your drums. And Mark Germany knew that so well that he started playing. And, 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 and all of this equipment, everything, all of these, this is, this is yours. And guess what? As you walk in the lobby, everything is yours. You, you are heirs with this. You are, you are working alongside with us. And you know what that also means is all of the guests are your guests. Do you know when we have first-time guests, people coming into our church? It's like them coming to our house, to our home. What do you do when they come through the door? After they knock, of course. They come through the door. You walk them in. You get them, get them some coffee. You help them find a seat. You visit with them. And so guests, they are your guests. It's like them coming into your house. You see a piece of trash in a parking lot of the church or the school. Guess what? That's your trash. Right? It's your trash. We're going to pick it up. And we're going we're to do everything we can to work together. And so we have the difference here between a slave, which is an employee, or, or a son, which is an heir. Look at this in Romans eight seventeen. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Everything God has, he wants you to have. I know there's a lot of people maybe talking about this, you know, prosperity gospel. And, and there's a good balance there really is a good balance to this. God wants to bless you in an enormous amount of ways, but not just so you can have it. He just wants to give it to his kids because we're part of a family. And then when we give it to others on his behalf, we give it to others on his behalf. God wants you blessed so that you can be a blessing to the world around you. Not just so you can have everything you, everything you want, but everything God has, he wants to give it to you. He longs to bless you so you can be a blessing. He longs to bless you so you can be a blessing. So there's a third way, a third difference between this. And sort of to set this up, we're gonna have a sort of a pre-scripture set up to this. We, we talked about grace uh, in our previous message to this in, in uh, Galatians chapter 3 a couple of weeks ago. Some legalistic Christians think that people just need to change rather than receive this free gift of grace without any sign of change. Um, you know, grace has to be free. Grace has to be free. Grace is receiving everything God wants you to have without you doing anything because you cannot do everything until that happens to you first. Grace doesn't mean that you don't have to do anything. It just means that you don't have to, you don't have to do anything first. It's the order that, that, that matters. So let me explain. Grace is a gift. You don't have to do anything to, to, to deserve it or to earn it. It's given to you. You receive that. You don't have to do anything. You receive it. You know, the, it's like going to wash your car before you take it to a car wash. That's crazy. Why would you do that? There are people I know that do that. They don't want to have their car out, in the, out, out visible, dirty in front of everybody. They don't want to drive through town to the car wash, so they wash their car at home before they go to the car wash. It's crazy. You know people live their life like that, too. They think, oh, well, if, I, if I'm going to go to church, I need to clean up my life. I need to clean up my life first. No, 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 no. You come just filthy, just as you are. It doesn't matter. Come just as you are. It's free. You receive it. Now, after you receive it, there are things you're going to want to do. Why? Because your heart longs to you, because you have the desire, because you want to please God the Father, not please him as a master or an employer you want to do it out of desire to please him because you love him. It's all about relationships. I, um, 
I got a, I had a conversation this week with, with, a, uh, with a girl, probably mid to late 20s. She's a former student of mine. And I shared this with Suzanne last night. Her name is Jessica. And, uh, and Jessica, let's just say Jessica for a while hasn't really been living for the Lord. Some of the places she works, the, uh, the businesses she was a part of, um, and she wasn't married. She's still not married and has, she has two uh, children, I think maybe three children actually. And so Jessica, um, we're Facebook friends. And sometimes she'd put stuff on there. It's like, whoa, <laughs> you know, maybe I don't need to follow Jessica, <laughs> you know. But lately, over the past few, um, few weeks, she, put in, she was putting some things like, I'm so grateful for God for what he's done. I was like, whoa, Jessica, what's, what's up with this? And I, and I really try to follow, in, you know, as many students as I can because I, I, I really invested my life and my heart in the students. I mean, I, I, I quit teaching about, gosh, 18 years ago, 18, something like that. And, but, but it's been my heart's desire that my students would come to follow Christ. And they knew I was a believer. I led the FCA there on the campus. And so, but when Jessica started posting things about God, and then she posted something about Jesus, I'm like, all right, so I reached out to her yesterday. I said, Jessica, this is Mr. B. They call me Mr. B. This is Mr. B. And um, it's like, there's something that changed in your heart. I'm sensing that. And this is what Jessica wrote back as we messaged together. She says, I'm going through a lot, but it's also been a period in my life where I have so much peace. I gave Christ my yes. <laughs> I love that. I gave Christ my yes, and he changed everything. I've experienced so much peace. It seemed like my life was falling apart, and through Christ, I see it's all coming together. I'm actually wanting to be baptized. It's going to be so amazing. The moment I gave Christ my yes, the entire church rejoiced. It was such a beautiful moment. My daughter also gave Christ her yes. My children have been attending with me, and they too were moved by the Holy Spirit. It was just so incredible. That's Jessica. Can I tell you something? <laughs> There was a transformation. There was a transformation. As you look from the outside looking into Jessica's life, there was a transformation because she was living this way. She wasn't trying to, to do good. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, something changed. All of a sudden, it was a 180 degree turn. Something changed in her heart and her life, and it was Jesus. It was about the relationship. And so, she became an heir with Christ. She became a child of God. So, as we look at this last area of the difference between a slave and a son, just know this, that... Um, that we see a little bit of, Paul explains this in Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Another tr translation for will is desire. So, Jessica has a desire and a will to live for God and to work out her salvation. She was saved. She accepted Christ. She's going to get baptized. She's going to church. She's doing all the things because why? She has the desire. The relationship is there. Jesus changed her heart. Jesus changed her life. 
And so we do things because of a relationship, of a desire. So the last difference is a slave is driven by duty. A slave is driven by duty. So if you complain about going to church, if you complain about giving, if you complain about serving, then your, your approach to relationship with God is as a slave. If we complain about those things, if you feel like, oh, I have to, I have to I give, I have to do all those things. Can I tell you something? And you should know this by now. I'm never going to tell you you have to do something. That's, that's driving you. That's a cowboy leading cattle. I'm going to ask you and encourage you. I'm never going to tell you you have to. You have to give. You have to serve. You have to come to church. Uh-uh. No. I encourage you out of love for your Savior. And that is leading you like a shepherd leads sheep. I'm a, I'm a shepherd, not a cowboy. And so, I'm never going to ask you, you have to do this. You have to give. You have to give. And in fact, I'm really careful. I know our, our elders and, and, and other leaders, they, they may know more, well, they do. They know more about what's going on financially within our church. And we, we still got to catch some of the new elders up to speed. But I'm very careful in not, in not giving every, every little thing. Now, you, you want to know it, we'll tell you. But here's the reason why. I, I don't want you to give to, to, to pay a bill. Do you understand me? I don't want you to give because you have to. Oh, we're, this is our situation. We're not doing this. You know, so you have to give. No, 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 no. No, I, I, I don't want to do that. I want you to give because you want to, because you desire to. And if you knew everything that was going on, and, and again, I'm, we're not trying to hide anything. You, you ask, we'll tell you. But I'm just real careful because I don't ever want you to feel like that you approach giving in a legalistic sort of way. I want you to give, and I want you to, I want you to give because the Lord wants you to give, and, 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 a, and a tithe, I mean, it's 10%, just Give to the Lord because he wants you to do that and we want to please him. Now, I know there are many people who are already there. You're already giving because you desire and you give more and above and beyond and that's awesome. But we want to give, we want to serve, we want to attend, we want to be involved not because we have to, because we desire to. You could tell Jessica's life has changed because she now has a desire. She now has a desire to be and to grow and to be that, that, that child of God and to live like that. So a slave is driven by duty, but a son or a daughter is driven by devotion. A son is driven by devotion. You come to church, give, you serve because you love with your heavenly father, your dad. There's a great story in Luke chapter 10. Feel free to turn there if you want. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. You may be familiar with this passage about Mary and Martha. Luke 10, 38 says this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted, big word there, by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? She's grumbling. Rah, 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 rah. And how many times do we come to church like that? How many times? Rah, 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 rah. He's talking about giving. Rah, 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 rah. Tell her to help me. Verse 41, Martha, Martha. I <laughs> love that. He's got to be shaking his head. Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or, or indeed, only one. Mary has what? Has chosen. 
Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Both of these ladies loved Jesus, and they wanted to serve him. But they were doing it with different spirits. They were doing it with different spirits. Mary chose the relationship, and it is better. Mary chose the relationship at his feet, and it is better. So, a slave is driven by duty. A son is driven by devotion. So, how do we choose? How do we do it? How do we choose devotion over duty? Look at Galatians 4, 8 through 9. So, back to Galatians Chapter 4, 8 through 9. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who were by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? In other words, don't go back to those, those religious, legalistic practices to try to appease you know, God out of duty. Now, to win his approval, when you are in a slave approach to a relationship with God, it's because you don't know God. But to approach a relationship as an heir or child, you need to know God. You desire to know God. So how do we know God? How do you know God? So as I close, there's three simple ways I'm going to leave you with on how you can know God to choose devotion over duty, to choose to be a son or daughter and not a slave. Okay? So how do we do this? Number one, we see God as father. You have to see God as father. Your view of God would determine your relationship with God. What does God look like? I love this in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 9 through 11, it says this, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, some of you have had some bad earthly fathers. You didn't have that good relationship with your father. And let me tell you something. That's all the devil's schemes. The reason why the devil created that bad relationship is because it it wasn't just so you could have a bad relationship with your your earthly father. It's so that because how you see God is how you see your earthly father. Many people. It's easy to, it's hard to come to God the father if you have had a bad relationship with your heavenly father. And so, there's going to take some time of, of healing need to take place. But if you've had a, a bad relationship with your earthly father, know this. God wants to change it. He wants to heal that. So how do we get to know God? How do we choose devotion over duty? We've got to see him as father. Second thing, approach God through relationships, not rules. Approach him through a relationship, not rules. Rules. I love this in John 5, 39 through 40. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So what, what he's saying, what Jesus is saying is like, look, it's good to read the Bible, but don't read the Bible so you can go to heaven. Come to me for life. Come to me for life. Oh, I got to read these chapters a day. Oh, I'm falling behind. I've got to, you know, rigorously do this. Now, it's good to have a routine, absolutely. And yes, there are some days I don't feel like reading God's word, okay? But we plow through it, absolutely. Or if you run across the scripture, you're like, whoa, <laughs> he's talking to me there, and we got to apply that. But some, some people think you read the Bible because that's how you get to heaven, Okay? The goal is not to read the Bible. The goal is to find Jesus. The goal is not to read the Bible. The goal is to find Jesus, to find God in the midst of the pages of the Bible. So we have to view God as Father. 
We have to view God as Father, okay? Not as employer, employer or master, okay? As, as a master-slave relationship. And then we have to approach him as a relationship, not a rule. And then third and final, give God your whole heart. Give God your whole heart. Falling in love with God doesn't work unless you go all in. Falling in love with God doesn't work unless you go all in. If you go 90%, if you go only go 90% or less, I mean, or, or just if you don't go all, all, all in, you're going to say, well, this isn't fun. You're right. It's not fun. It's not fun. Let's use this as an example as it came to my head. Let's say you go to Six Flags or Disney. Let's choose Disney. You go to Disney World and you have all these incredible rides and you stand in line. Let's say you did this at Disney and all you do is stand in line. Now some of you, maybe you've done that before. Maybe you've been to Disney or Six Flags or a theme park and all you did was stand in line. But I'm sure you've read, you wrote a few lines. But let's say you, you, you stand in line for these rides and you get right up to the point to where they let you in. It's like, ah, oh, no. I don't want to go. And then you just, just walk out. And you go to the next ride. And you stand in line for an hour. And you wait and you get it right up to the line. And you say, ah, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Now you you want to experience Disney? You go all in. You go all in. You stand in line and you ride the ride. Some of us approach Christianity, our relationship with God, and we don't go all in. We stand in line. We stand in line. And when God's like, hey, now it's time for some faith. You ready? <laughs> it's time for some faith. Let me put some things to, you, to the test. Let me, see, let me see if you trust me. Of course, if we're at Six Flags or Disney, Disney we're trusting the teenage kid right, you know, running the ride, right? <laughs> and we're trusting that bar, right? But in Christianity, we, we stand in line and God's like, all right, so... Um, we're going to test you here. And it's, and, and it's going to be a little scary, but when it's done, you're like, yes, let's do that again. Let's do that again. This time I'm going to hold my hands up the whole time. Right? Let's do that again. That's what, that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to go all in. Jessica, she's going all in. She's going all in. I love that. She did just choose Christ, and they're like, okay, I accepted Christ, and I said the prayer. And she's not being around other believers. She's not praying. She's not reading the Bible. And, all. and again, you don't, you don't do that because you have to. You could tell it's real. You could tell it's real because she desires to do it. No one is making her. No one is making her. Jesus changed her life. She has a new life in Christ, and she does it because she wants to. Last scripture, Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with what? All your heart. All your heart. Not part of it. Not stand in line and then get out. No. No. All of your heart. You will experience God. You will get to know God with all that you are. If you, give, if you dive in, you go all in with everything that you're doing. Prayer, Bible reading, being around other believers, get, you know, increasing, growing in your faith, giving, serving, all of this. I am all in because I want to. Because I desire to. You know, a relationship with Jesus changes everything. A relationship with Jesus changes everything. How is your relationship with Jesus? And all it takes is simply saying, and I, I'm ready to call you daddy. I'm ready to call you daddy. I need this relationship. I need to sit at your feet. 
I don't need to be working in the kitchen trying to prove myself. I'm ready, I'm ready to sit at your feet. And then the Holy Spirit moves in your life. As we close, please bow your head and close your eyes. We always give an opportunity for people to make an adjustment in their life. And maybe there are some people here today or watching online and, and you're like, well, you know, Frank, I'm, I've been in the kitchen like, like Martha and I've been just trying to, trying to prove my worth that I'm sold out to God. But that's not the way. I'm ready to sit at his feet like, feet like Mary. I'm ready to be a son or daughter of God, not a slave. So help me with my desire. So, I'm, so maybe you need to do this. You need to just tell the Lord, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to be your son, your daughter. Please help me to do that. Please forgive me for the times that I do stuff out of duty and not desire or devotion. And maybe you're here today and you've never called him daddy, daddy God because you don't have that relationship. But he's been knocking on your heart's door. Maybe that's the reason why you're here today or you're listening or watching. He's knocking on your heart's door. And it's time for you to open that door. It's time for you to receive that gift. And all it takes is just to surrender your life. Say, God, I surrender my life to you. Jesus, I believe you died for me. Please forgive me my sin. Please come into my life. I'm ready to live for you. And I'm ready to go all in. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.